Well, turn back to Acts chapter number 9. If you uh, didn't turn away, you can just uh, stay there. And as we read in preparation for the sermon this morning, we're just going to pick up where we left off and continue reading uh, another large chunk of this chapter. I would invite you at this time to stand once you find it, and and we'll uh, show reverence for God's Word as we prepare for the preaching. Acts chapter 9, we've already got the lead up, the context, and the section we're going to be focusing on is in, in this passage we're about to read. Follow along as I begin to read in verse number 19. The Bible says, And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed. And said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem, and came hither for that intent, that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? But Saul increased the more in strength, and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. And after that, many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. But their laying await was known of Saul, And they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples. But they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way. And that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them, coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus, and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. Which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus, Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. Lord, I do ask one final time that you would be with us and instruct us with your word. Now Uh, feed each of us what it is that we need. Lord, everyone here is in a different uh, place in their spiritual life. And in a different situation, a different set of circumstances, and yet your word is profitable for every single one of us here. And I ask that you would, again, remove distractions, help us to focus not simply to gather more knowledge about the history of this man, Saul, but to see what it is that you want to do in each one of our lives today. In Jesus' name I ask this. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated one more time. I don't spend a whole lot of time reading or watching the news, and I don't recommend that you do either, Uh, but I try and find the balance between, uh, on the one extreme, being a news junkie, and on the other extreme, having my head stuck in the sand, as it were. I I think there's some kind of happy medium somewhere in between those two extremes, and I don't claim to have the perfect balance, Uh, but I try to, uh, again, have some sense of awareness of what's going on in our nation and in our world, and at the same time, not be so wrapped up in all those things that Uh, I allow those things to get me uh, stirred up and anxious and concerned and worried and outraged. Uh, One of the things I read this week, uh, you may or may not have have seen this headline, was that there is uh, some uh, organization within North Korea that figured out how to get North Korean citizens employed at around 300 different U.S. companies, primarily for remote work positions. Uh, And... Basically, the the gist of the story was that as U.S. companies have moved more to uh, remote work, allowing people to, hey, anywhere you have an internet connection and a laptop, uh, there's jobs that you can do. Some of you may have done that kind of work. I know I did uh, before coming here. And that has changed the hiring practices as well uh, and how companies screen who it is that they're going to bring into their organization. Uh, and how they filter, who is it that we're going to give money and and expect them to do work for us. And what had happened was that a lady in Arizona, she's been charged with a federal crime for this, but she had basically set up a laptop farm in her house, 
so that North Koreans could do their remote work through her laptops so that it looked like they were working from the United States. Uh, and over the course of, uh, of this whole scheme, what happened was, uh, again, hundreds of US, major US companies and industries hired unknowingly these North Korean workers. They're doing remote work. The work seems like it's getting done. They made it through the job interviews and the screening, however they did that. And now millions and millions of dollars for a period of a couple of years, since about 2020, have been funneled from all these different companies into the North Korean weapons programs. Because there was a, a lack of filtering, there was a lack of screening, there was an improper process by which those employees were authenticated. The companies got duped and, and it's been discovered now, but uh, it remains to be seen how much more of this has gone on and uh, what the long-term consequences of something like this uh, would possibly be. And my point there is not to, again, uh, get you focused or spun up or worried about um, what North Korea is doing or the North Korean weapons program or the fact that American money ended up, uh, to some degree, funding North Korean nuclear weapons program. That's not the point of this at all. I just want you to see uh, the importance of these companies' uh, screening and authentication process. And we'll come back and we'll revisit that in just a moment. Uh, we took a couple weeks off, but we started about a month or so ago a series of messages looking at the biblical concept of church membership. And we've studied several different passages so far. We started in 1 Corinthians chapter number 12 and spent two weeks there. That's a passage that describes the idea of a church as a body. It makes an analogy to a human body and says, as the Holy Spirit gifts new believers with different spiritual gifts and talents and abilities, it's just like how every member of your body has a different strength and a different function and different things that it can accomplish. And the body only works when all those different members get connected together in the right way. And then the body, the human body, is a, this amazing uh, marvel of God's creation and engineering that you can take a, a liver and a pancreas and a toenail and an elbow and a nose and some hair and put all those things together and think of everything that a human body is able to do. That's what a church is supposed to be like. God takes members and spiritually, no two Christians are exactly alike. Uh, again, it's, it's like the, you know, I've been told, you know, no two snowflakes are alike or no two fingerprints are alike and uh, that may, may or may not be the case, I don't know, but no two Christians spiritually are alike in the way they've been gifted and enabled by God's Holy Spirit. And God's intent, he puts all those members into a body as he sees fit, not a universal worldwide uh, uh, myth uh, mystical thing, but local, individual, discrete assemblies like this one, Beacon Baptist Church. And the members that God places into Beacon Baptist Church are specially designed uh, to perform different functions in each individual body. And, and God does an amazing work that that, uh, that way. And all the gifts that each member brings to the table mutually benefit the whole body and, and therefore the other members. That's the way the Christian life is designed to be lived is as a member that is a part of a body. So we studied that for a couple of weeks. Uh, we looked, I think two weeks ago at Acts chapter two, verse number 41, that memory passage that we're starting to look at uh, that starts by saying that they that gladly received his word, that's Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost, they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And we looked at the requirements for church membership. What has to happen for somebody to uh, go from, uh, you know, Joe Smith out on the street to church member, and it's gladly received the word, that's salvation being saved, they were baptized, and then they were added to the church. It's, it's relatively straightforward. And so I think we understand that. And today what I want you to uh, study with me, if you would, is the idea of a transfer of church membership. Here's the question we're trying to answer. What happens when somebody shows up at a church and they've already been saved and they've already been baptized? Uh, we added Miss Janice to our membership uh, last week by baptism, and that's how she joined our church. But what if you've already been baptized? How is that supposed to work? Uh, and the Bible gives us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And we have an example here in our text of a man who was associated with one group of disciples and he moved to another city and became associated with another group of disciples. Look with me, if you would, at verse number 26 of Acts 9. 
We're going to focus this morning primarily on verses 26 through 28. And in the context of being a member of a body of believers, look at the course of events in Saul's life. It says, when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he'd left Damascus. He's come to a new city. He came to Jerusalem. He essayed to join himself to the disciples. That's what we're talking about, joining. But they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and how he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. The congregation at Jerusalem had an authentication process to verify that Saul actually was a disciple like he claimed to be. Saul showed up and he essayed to join himself. I want to be a part of this. I want to join these disciples. And they said, there's, hold on, nothing personal. We need to make sure that this is really the case because we've heard about you. You have a little bit of a reputation and not a good one. And so there was an authentication process. Again, think about those workers that were uh, hired by different companies. They were not sufficiently authenticated. They didn't do enough due diligence to verify that those employees were actually who they said they were. It turns out they weren't Americans from Arizona. They were North Koreans from north of the DMZ. And here, the church at Jerusalem is saying to Saul, we need to verify, we need to authenticate who you are. And that you are actually a disciple because initially, just at the outset, uh, we don't believe that. We, we need some, uh, some support for that. And in, that, in this case, it was Barnabas who provided that. We'll look at the details of that in a moment. So two things I want you to take away from today. One is a technical matter. One is a practical matter. At a technical level, what I want to explain to everyone here, whether you're a member here or not, uh, whether you're a visitor or guest or, or have been here for years, uh, I want all of us to understand how Beacon Baptist Church goes about this process of authenticating. When someone says, I'm a disciple, I want to join, what, what is it that we do? Why do we have a process for uh, verifying and, and authenticating that someone truly is who they say that they are? That's the technical side of things. On a practical level, and this is, I believe, much more important and, and applies to every single soul sitting here today, I want you to ask yourself this question. If I was showing up at a church for the first time and they said, well, can you prove that you're actually a disciple of Jesus Christ? What would Barnabas say about you? That's the question today. Saul couldn't hand them a resume and have them accept it. He wasn't able to really uh, vouch for himself. They weren't going to take his word for it. There was somebody that they knew who stood up and said, I've observed this man's life. I have seen his, his uh, faith. I've seen his testimony. And I am absolutely convinced that this man has met the Lord. And there's some things that Barnabas said uh, that caused him to be convinced. And he then uh, spoke on Saul's behalf to the congregation at Jerusalem. And again, I will explain some of our church's procedures today. But I, I don't want you to get distracted by that from, from this question what would Barnabas have to say about me? If Barnabas had spent, uh, I don't know how long they'd known each other, if Barnabas spent some time being around my life, if Barnabas saw how I order my schedule on a regular basis, if Barnabas saw my manner, my spirit, my activities, my speech, what would Barnabas tell a congregation about me? What would be my resume? Would Barnabas be able to authenticate me as a third party as someone who truly meets the description of a disciple of Jesus Christ. Four things I want to look at in Saul's life here. Uh, before we get to, again, the main focus of our text, I just want you to look at how Saul's life was altered, the alteration in his life. Look at verse number 20. After he met the Lord on the way to Damascus, it says this in Acts 9.20, And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, is not this he that destroyed them, which called on his this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? 
But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. I don't have time this morning to go into a uh, in detail look at Saul's conversion and this account where he met the Lord, but I need you to understand this about it. Saul was a devout and a religious man. Saul was an upstanding, zealous man. Uh, he described later in his life that after the straightest sect of the Pharisees, I followed God's law as touching the holy scriptures that God gave the nation of Israel. Paul said, as touching the law, blameless. That's the life that Paul was living. He, uh, we look at it from a different perspective because he was persecuting Christians, but Saul was a devout man who believed in God and who actually thought that he was doing God's service. And it turns out, even though he was sincere, even though he was devout, and even though he desired to please and to serve and to worship God, it turns out that he was ignorant and he was unbelieving specifically in the deity of Jesus Christ. That's what hadn't happened in his life. And because he was ignorant, that's not a derisive term. It doesn't mean he was unintelligent. There were some things he did not know, some things he was ignorant of, specifically who Jesus Christ was. And the Lord had mercy on Saul. He, he says this later, looking back on his life after becoming a Christian, he said, the Lord, I can't believe that God put me in the ministry. I can't believe God made me an apostle and a preacher because I used to be a blasphemer. I used to say uh, blasphemous things about Jesus Christ. I was a persecutor. I killed men and women who followed Jesus Christ. I was injurious, but, he says, I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And as Saul went on the road to Damascus at this point in his life, the Lord Jesus Christ was merciful to him. If you are the Lord Jesus Christ, having come down, died for all mankind, been crucified, uh, spat upon and beaten and uh, uh, mangled in unimaginable ways and put to death by God's chosen people. Now Jesus Christ has ascended up to the right hand of fa the Father. He's been glorified. He's been promoted. He's been exalted back to all his glory and more. Someone like Saul, if it was me, Someone like Saul, if it was you, I, my inclination would probably be to squish him like a bug. This guy's killing those who follow me. This guy is blaspheming my holy name. This man is ignorant. This man is unbelieving. And yet, instead of striking him down, instead of taking his life, instead of condemning him eternally, the Lord Jesus Christ looked down and had mercy on this man and shined light into his life, here a literal light, uh, but he would write later of spiritual light, the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ that shined in his heart and showed him the glory of who Jesus Christ actually was. And here's what changed in Saul's life. He realized, he said, who art thou, Lord? He's knocked down to the ground and this, this light that he would describe later is brighter than the noonday sun. And he's on his face. I, I know this is God. This is... No other explanation is available other than that God is talking to me. Who art thou, Lord? I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Because Jesus is God, manifest in the flesh. And that's what changed Saul's life is when he came to the realization that Jesus was not just a teacher. Jesus was not just a miracle worker. Jesus was not just a moral man or a good man or a wise man. He is almighty son of God and he is the Lord. And that acknowledgement and that recognition made an immediate drastic change in the life of Saul of Tarsus. So much so again that we see in verse number 21, days later, people who heard him were amazed. They didn't recognize him. The things coming out of his mouth were totally different. Uh, the actions and the behaviors and, and the spirit was totally different. And I wonder this morning, have you had a moment in your life where the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ brought you to your knees and shined in your heart and showed you that Jesus Christ is the merciful Lord and Son of God who died to save you from your sins? 
and who's willing to forgive you from even sins against his own holy name. And if so, can others see that difference in your life? The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Behold, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And we sometimes have a difficult time living in a country with as much religious freedom as we still have because we are not required oftentimes to make as drastic of a proclamation. It doesn't make as big of an uh, automatic change in our life to change loyalties and say, I'm going from the side of those who are against Christ to those who are for Christ. Here, it endangered Saul's life to make that decision. Where we live, many would just say, well, I'm happy for you, that's great. But if people in your life, since you became a Christian, since you realized who Jesus Christ actually is, have they seen as big a difference in your life as Saul's associates saw in his life? Where it amazes them. Say, is this even the same person who was headed here that we knew before that was blaspheming and persecuting? He changed so much that they were amazed at what had happened to him. And back more to the subject of our, of our study, I want to see just very briefly that Saul met all the requirements for church membership. We studied this in Acts 2.41. Uh, to be a church member, one must gladly receive the word, be baptized, and then be added. And you see those components in Saul's life. Clearly, he received Jesus as the Lord. Verse 18 says he arose and was baptized. And then it says, verse 19, that Saul was certain days with the disciples that were at Damascus. Uh, again, it follows the pattern that we read about in Acts chapter number 2, that those that uh, were saved and baptized and added, they continued steadfastly, as we recited this morning, in the apostles' fellowship and doctrine. And Saul's doing that here at Damascus. Someone who days earlier had been persecuting and mocking and blaspheming Christians now is so totally converted that his immediate response is to begin to boldly preach Jesus. That's what the Bible describes as the mark of Saul's changed life. And I wonder again, for you, if you profess to have met the Lord Jesus Christ as Saul did, if you've been saved, have you preached boldly who Jesus Christ is to others? That's the mark of Saul's conversion. It's his preaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. When's the last time, I'm preaching to myself this morning, when's the last time you opened your mouth and said to somebody who probably didn't want to hear it, let me tell you who Jesus Christ is. Let me tell you about his mercy. Let me tell you about his lordship. Let me tell you about his sacrifice on the cross. Saul preached boldly in the name of Jesus Christ because his life had been changed. Look at verse 26. And that was his alteration. alteration. His life was changed. Look at his aim. Look what he was trying to do in verse number 26. It says, when Saul was come to Jerusalem he essayed to join himself to the disciples. He essayed to join himself to the disciples. People leave towns and relocate, and people leave churches and reposition for a lot of different reasons. Some of them good, some of them not so good. Saul left the city of Damascus, and he left the church of Damascus because people were trying to kill him. I say that's a pretty okay reason to leave a city. That's a reasonable uh, justification for finding another place to go to church. They were laying wait to take his life. And yet, Saul, having preached boldly in the name of Jesus, so much so that the same Jews whose side he used to be on are trying to kill him. Think about that for a moment. I don't know if anyone here, I, I don't know your background, maybe you've had a rougher past than, than I know about. I don't know many people here who have had somebody... Threaten your life. I want to end your breath and heartbeat. That's the situation Saul's in. Because of his belief in Jesus Christ. If Saul doesn't believe in Jesus Christ, if he doesn't preach Jesus, if he doesn't follow Jesus, nobody's trying to kill him. He was safe. He was uh, uh, actually had a, a position of prestige and power. But it was because of his belief in Jesus Christ that people are trying to slaughter him. 
And having been chased out of Damascus because of his belief in Jesus Christ, his first action when he gets to Jerusalem is, I need to find some more disciples and join myself to them. I want to be with other people who follow this Lord. I want to be a part of an assembly of baptized believers who are as committed to this merciful Lord Jesus Christ as I am. And his response upon arriving at Jerusalem, even though he got run out of town in Damascus for, uh, uh, for following Jesus, is I want to be with other disciples of Jesus. He essayed to join himself proactively with the disciples. To join something is to adhere to or to cleave to something. And here's what we need to understand about the term to join. When you join something, the implication of that word in a variety of contexts is that I intend for these two things to stay together. Now you think about a joint in woodworking. When you join two pieces of wood together, there are all kinds of different ways you can do it, different materials, different hardware, different cuts. When you join those two pieces of wood together, the idea is those two things are going to stay stuck together. To join something is to, uh, to cleave to it, to adhere to it. It's a lasting, close attachment, not just a casual association. Uh, again, two pieces of wood that are joined together, it's not just close to each other. They're not just associated. They're not just in the same place. They're connected in a fixed way. And that's what's happened here. And, and Saul says, I want to have that kind of a connection to other disciples in the city of Jerusalem. He is said to join himself with them. And the Bible uses this term in another passage where it goes back to the metaphor of the church as a body. We've looked at this passage many times over the last year. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 16 it says that in a church, the members are to be fitly joined together. A body part is no good, I've said this many times, if it's just in the same place as other body parts. It has to be joined. There's a connection there that I hope my body parts are connected in a lasting way. I don't want them to just be associated with and around my body. I want them to be connected. I want them to be joined. Otherwise, it's not very profitable to me for those members to be there. And, and so that's the idea. Saul says, I want to join with the other disciples. I want to be connected to them. I want to cleave to this fellowship. I want to be attached to to it. This is the idea, again, of church membership, and that was Saul's heart desire, despite the fact that his life was in peril for being a follower of Jesus Christ, for being a disciple of Jesus Christ, said, I want to get connected with other disciples of Jesus Christ. That's the idea. And he shows up at Damascus, and you know, I don't, I don't know what their process was. Maybe they had an invitation, and all right, raise your hand if you're interested in church membership today, and come to the front. And uh, you know, Saul went and talked to the minister, the elder, the, the bishop, and said, yep. I just came from Damascus. I'm a disciple. I'm a Christian. I'd like to become a member of Jerusalem Baptist Church. And then we get to the next part. Verse number 26, the second half of the verse says, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. Saul probably got stopped at the door by the greeter slash security guard who may have been exercising his Second Amendment rights in a discreet way. They were a little bit concerned when Saul showed up. Saul's reputation had preceded him. And what I want you to see about this is that membership in that assembly of disciples, connection, being joined to that group of disciples was something that was binary and it was formal. A lot of times there's this idea that church membership is kind of just a, it's a spectrum and it's kind of a gradual thing. And eventually you just look back and, well, we've been going here for a while, and so I think we must be members. And a lot of churches do operate that way. But I find the biblical pattern to be that there was a point where Saul tried to join himself, and they said, whoa, whoa, whoa hold on, hold on. Let's verify some things. Let's, let's take care of this. They did not initially believe that he was a disciple. And, and membership, uh, at least here at Beacon Baptist Church, is that way. It's either you are or you are not. There's not kind of an in-between. There's not a question mark. There's not a gray area. There's not a, a gradual uh, uh, process, and it's it's biblical uh, that not everybody who sits in a church service is a church member. That's not a bad thing. That's not a good thing. That's just a fact of, of the way things are. In, in 1 Corinthians 14, one of the very few chapters that actually talks about the way that a church service or a church assembly operates, they've described as an example 
It doesn't say these are the only categories, but some of the categories are uh, people who would come to a church and would assemble with the church, but they're unlearned. They, they just don't really understand. There's some ignorance there, or they're unbelievers. They don't know Jesus Christ, but maybe they're there to find out more. And so not everybody who comes to church is a member. There's different categories, and that's the case for Saul here. I also want you to see that Saul could not unilaterally join this church. There was a, a two-way street that had to happen where Saul assayed. Saul proactively, he, uh, it was uh, his, uh, he took the, the impetus upon himself to say, I want to be a part of this. But then the assembly of disciples there, Saul couldn't just say, okay, I want to be here, I'm a member. He, they had to be, uh, receive him based on authenticating the fact that he was actually a disciple. And you would understand this concept if you think back to our example of uh, those North Koreans who were hired by American companies. When you go for any kind of job interview or any kind of uh, process where you're going to get hired or onboarded by some other organization, there is almost always going to be some step in the process where somebody asks you to verify that you really are who you say you are. And so most of us have a wallet or a purse that has some number of cards that you know have a, a picture of me and a seal by some organization that somebody considers official that says, See, I really am Andrew Geist. The state of Washington says so. Or I pull up my passport and say, see, Andrew Cameron Geist, I, I really am uh, a citizen of the United States. Unfortunately for Saul, there's no such thing as a Christian passport. There's no Christian ID card that you can pull out and flash and say, see, I'm a Christian. See, I'm saved. And so the question that this group of disciples was faced with is how do we verify, how do we make sure that Saul actually is a disciple? Because if he is a disciple, absolutely, we want to be connected to him as much as he wants to be connected to us. This is not an antagonistic process. It's not malice towards Saul. Notice that they didn't say, if you ever darken the doors of this place again, after everything you've done to our Savior, after everything you've done to persecute Christians, don't let the door hit you on the way out. They just said, hold on, we need to make sure that you're really a disciple. It's not a, there's not an animosity or a malice or antagonism. It's simply, we just need to verify for our own safety, we got to make sure that Saul actually is who he says he is. And the way that they did that was through this man, Barnabas. So look at this in verse uh, 27. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. Barnabas, a man who was known and trusted by the church at Jerusalem, he had a testimony there. Uh, he was invested in the ministry there at Jerusalem. And so when Barnabas stood up and, you know, maybe as the security guards are trying to usher Saul off the front porch, Barnabas walked up and was able to put his arm around Saul and say, no, he's with me. This is okay. And he began, it, it wasn't just a, hey, it's fine, he can join. He began to explain some things about Saul's life. And Saul testified, I know from watching this man's life, he has met the Lord. Barnabas wasn't there on the road to Damascus. He wasn't an eyewitness to those events, but he had observed Saul's life in Damascus and said, there's no other way that somebody could be the way that Saul is without having truly met the Lord Jesus Christ, without truly believing that Jesus Christ is the risen Lord and the Savior, and his ultimate proof of all that, that he shared with the church at Jerusalem was this at the end of verse number 27, how he had preached boldly. How he had preached boldly. And I would ask all of us again, I've been asking myself this this week, what would Barnabas be able to say about me? If Barnabas was ushered in and a church was asking, how do we know that Andrew's really a disciple of Jesus Christ? Give us some proof. What would Barnabas be able to stand up and testify about my life? Here's what Barnabas did not say about Saul. He is a fine, upstanding citizen of high moral character. He didn't say, he is a faithful attender at the church at Damascus. Didn't say, he takes care of his family, and he pays his bills, and he's kind to those who are less fortunate than himself. He's very religious. He knows his Bible. None of those things. 
Barnabas' proof that Saul was a disciple of Jesus Christ was this man boldly preaches that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And this is a hard thing for me to swallow because I, I like to think that externally, as man is able to see, not, not in the heart, but externally, I like to think I have a, a pretty clean, put-together life. I like to convince myself of that. And I suspect that's the case for many of us here. We're all here in our church clothes today. Uh, again, none of us, uh, you know, delinquent or being chased by the law, and, and we have our families that we try and take care of, and, and uh, we're trying to live the, a good, moral, upstanding life. But that doesn't actually separate us from very many people. See, I found this to be the case over the course, you know, meet a lot of people over the course of a military career. Some of the uh, kindest, cleanest living people that I ever met were not Christians. They're Mormons. I believe the Mormons preach a false gospel. But they have some faithful, devoted, clean living, kind, loving people. And so simply to say, Andrew's a nice guy, Andrew lives an upright life, is not enough to say that marks someone indisputably as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Here's the mark. How much do you preach to other people who Jesus is? In situations where it would affect you negatively, so much so that in Saul's life, he's getting thrown out of a city by people who want to kill him. How much have I, this week, opened my mouth and proclaimed to somebody, let me tell you about Jesus Christ the Lord. We do all kinds of outreach at our church. We met yesterday. We mailed letters to people in our community. We went and walked the streets and put copies of the books of John and Romans on people's front doors. That's good. I think we should do that. We'll continue to do that. That's not preaching. And preaching is not... You have to have a suit and a microphone and stand up in front of a church congregation. Preaching is simply declaring to somebody else the gospel of Jesus Christ, verbally. Opening your mouth. That scares me. And, and I live in a country that has great religious freedom. There are almost no consequences for me to walk up to somebody in downtown Gig Harbor and engage them in conversation about the Lord Jesus Christ I'd like to think I'm not a scaredy cat, but when you put me in that situation, I am. And Barnabas said, this is how I know this man is a disciple of Jesus Christ, because he boldly preaches to people who will kill him when they find out Jesus Christ is Lord. And he died, and he was buried, and he rose again to save sinners from their sins. And so, yes, I'm here to explain to you, this is some of the questions that we'll ask if you... Uh, approach me about membership at Beacon Baptist Church, but it's so much more than that. It's what is my spiritual resume? What would somebody be able to say if they had to authenticate my spiritual life? And we're rapidly running out of time. I won't turn you to these places, but I'll simply tell you this. When it comes to the matter of how, does a, how should a church operate? Somebody shows up, somebody we've never met, and we have to do something to say, how do we know this person's really a disciple? One of the methods used throughout the New Testament was what's called a letter of commendation. And so Acts chapter 18, a man named Apollos was a believer in the city of Ephesus, and he was disposed to pass to Achaia. He's going to go across the water, go from Asia Minor, the west coast there, down to northern, uh, or to southern Greece, rather. And it says that they wrote a letter to send with him, exhorting the brethren at Corinth to receive him. And so we practice that today. If someone comes here from another church of like faith by having what we call a transfer of letter. And so when we moved here from Seattle, Washington, there was a letter, a little bit of a unique situation because both churches had the same pastor at the time. But Pastor McMillan formally writes a letter from Skyline Baptist Church. These are disciples of Jesus Christ. These are members in good standing. That letter gets passed along. And again, we, we, try, we use that as one way to try and... Uh, uh, implement the biblical principle here. Uh, when Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, he actually argued to them that he did not need a letter of commendation. But uh, this is 2 Corinthians uh, chapter number 3. But his reasoning was, normally there would be a letter needed to vouch for who we are, but I have ministered there to you. And his, his exhortation was, Barnabas and I, you are our letter of commendation. The fact that your life's been changed by the things that I've been preaching 
should be evidence enough that I don't need to bring a letter from another church to tell you who I am. It was because they already knew him. He did minister to them. And, and so we understand that a proof of, of someone's discipleship is not just preaching the gospel to the lost, but also ministering edification to other saints. That's evidence of somebody's discipleship is the effect they've had in, in ministering to other people. In Acts chapter number 19, uh, there were some disciples that uh, Paul ran into later on in his ministry. And he, he went, he looked for disciples as was his habit. He found about 12 men and he began to ask them questions. There were some probing questions, some questions that would cause most of us to get offended if somebody asked things that personal. He asked them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? They said, well, you know, now that you mentioned that, we've not heard if there be any such Holy Ghost. I don't really know what you're talking about. And so Paul's healthy skepticism towards those believers, long story short, and his probing questions to them to verify the fact that they were actually disciples led to those 12 men ultimately being saved and receiving the Holy Ghost. They, they had been misinformed. They had been uh, preached an incomplete gospel. They were not actually saved, even though they'd been baptized. And so Paul's questions and his skepticism that he brought to them ultimately ended in them receiving the Holy Ghost and being scripturally baptized. And that was the core of the church at Ephesus. And so this is our practice. And again, just uh, on the technical side of things, when someone uh, comes and, and inquires about membership, here's simply what we'll ask about. What, when were you saved? When did you meet the Lord Jesus Christ and, and trust that he is the son of God and believe in his sacrifice for your sins? When were you saved? We would ask about your baptism. Just as Paul did in Acts chapter 19 of those men, was it scriptural baptism? Not every baptism is scriptural baptism. And then finally, I would inquire as to someone's uh, doctrinal agreement with us. Are you uh, of the same mind? Are we of the same faith? Do we believe the same things? Those are the questions that we would ask of someone coming from membership here. And in Acts chapter 9, verse number 28, the end of the story is simply this. He was with them, coming in and going out at Jerusalem. When you piece together the different historical accounts that are found in the New Testament, what you'll find is that Paul was only in Jerusalem for 15 days. That's what Galatians chapter 1 tells us. And in 15 days, he joined himself to the disciples. They had some questions. Questions were answered. And he was with them, coming in and going out. And again, in American Christianity, uh, sometimes we have a very different mindset on church membership. And in, many times it is uh, uh, common, and I've seen this everywhere I've been in my Christian life, uh, to kind of try a place out and uh, try a little bit here, try a little bit there, and, and kind of just indefinitely be, be floating or, or church shopping, uh, as the case would be. And, and I'm not denigrating that. Here's what I say. It's wise to scrutinize, just as the church at Jerusalem was going to verify who Paul was. You should verify who you're joining. I'm all for that. You should be wise. You should examine our doctrine. You should examine our manner of life. You should examine our standards and our philosophy of ministry. But there's a certain point where you can't know everything about a group and you simply have to make a decision. It's kind of like getting married. It doesn't matter how long you spend with somebody. You will not know everything about them before marriage that you find out after marriage. That's simply the way that works. And, and that's certainly true of churches as well. Uh, and so Paul's testimony was, his example was, he went to Jerusalem and rapidly he essayed to join himself. They dealt with the matters that need to be dealt with. And then he was with them coming in and going out. Again, a lot of different reasons that people are hesitant to join a church. Uh, I've, I've seen um, some of those things happen in churches I've been in where there are church splits and there are church scandals and there are scoundrels in churches and those things make people hesitant. Uh, but the, uh, those things that do happen, even in, in uh, good Bible-believing churches, those things don't negate uh, the stress the Bible lays on joining yourself to other disciples and getting connected and attached uh, to those who are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it, Paul's example again is once he joined with them, he was with them coming in and going out. That's the example in Acts 2. That's the example here in Acts 9 that uh, joining a church is not simply about adding your name to a list of people. It's about getting connected with what's going on at that church, being with them. It says if they went out, he was with them. If they came back in, he was with them. Uh, he was uh, there accompanying them. And verse 29 says he began to speak boldly there at Jerusalem, just as he had in Damascus. He was part of their 
evangelistic efforts there in the city. And so as we look at Saul's life and you compare it to yours, the first and most important question of all is simply this. When in your life did you get on your knees and acknowledge Jesus Christ is the Lord? Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He, I deserve to be eternally condemned by the Lord Jesus Christ, but he's merciful and he's gracious. And he gave his own life to save me from my sins. Has the light of that gospel shined in your heart? And if so, has your life changed the way that Saul's has? That's the way it's supposed to work. I, it, there should be a night and day, unrecognizable difference. People amazed. Is this really the same person? Because your behavior, your speech, your actions, your emphases, the priorities in your life are so different now from before you met Jesus Christ. Is that your testimony? Is that what the people in your life would say about you concerning when you got saved? Is that change still present in your life? Because here's what happened. We meet Jesus, we get saved, we trust him and, and our life changes. But then all the mundane parts and hard parts of life come back around and some of those changes seem to start to fade and our priorities go back to what they were before. And it's not supposed to be just a point in time. It's supposed to be our entire life. Uh, Saul preached boldly at Damascus and he preached boldly at Jerusalem and he got kicked out of Jerusalem. He went and preached boldly in Tarsus. Then he preached boldly in Antioch and, and ultimately spread the gospel to the whole world. Is that the change that's in your life? Is that the change that's in my life that someone can tell I'm a disciple by the fact that I can't stop talking about who Jesus Christ is, not just to those who already agree with me, but to those who don't believe, those who would persecute, those who are opposed to it, am I boldly preaching in the name of Jesus Christ? And I just close with what I have asked a couple times throughout the sermon. Here or another congregation or anywhere else, if someone asked you about your discipleship and Barnabas was going to be the one to vouch for you, Barnabas was going to substantiate your Christian character, what would he have to say about you? If you looked at your life, if you looked at my life over the last month, over the last three months, six months, would he be able to say more than he follows the rules and is kind and law-abiding and takes care of his family and tries to avoid foul language and dirty deeds? Is there more to it than just clean living? Or, or would Barnabas be able to say, this is somebody whose life has been obviously changed by Jesus Christ and I can tell because he can't stop talking about it. 